Um, this next session is titled Human Milk at the Intersection of Maternal and Pediatric Therapeutics. And I'm very pleased uh, to have uh, four speakers here with us today who are sitting up on the dais. Uh, they're each going to give their talks. We'll have time for if there are one or two clarifying questions after each talk. And then at the end um, of the session, we'll have a, a good amount of time for a panel discussion. Uh, some of you uh, completed a pre-session uh, uh, survey, um, answered a question about what you think are the most pressing gaps in terms of lactation research. And the second question was, are there any technologies or techniques or approaches that you think should be explored um, in novel ways in this space? So we'll bring up some of those in the panel discussion at the end. So I'll, we'll get started. Um, our first speaker here, who you heard from yesterday, is Lin Yao, uh, who's the uh, director of the Division of Pediatric and Maternal Health in the Office of New Drugs, the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. And Dr. Yao is going to speak on regulatory issues in human lactation studies. Hopefully this is bringing up your slides. There it is. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tina. Um, just this. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm really uh, happy to be here. Uh, after this morning's discussion, I think I might have brought some, I don't know, shields to prevent the rotten fruit from being thrown this way. But actually, I do, I have taken all of what's been said in the first session, uh, I do wanna make some comments about that maybe in the panel session, but none of the things that you heard about, you know, being too slow or FDA being this or that, you know, you're not wrong. I do have some perspectives, but I will say, quite frankly, you're not wrong. Um, and I think there's some things that we can work on together to help uh, move things forward in the way that they really, that a pregnant and lactating individuals deserve to have. So that is a preface for, and I'm going to switch gears. I'm going to talk about lactation. Um, so I do want to acknowledge my colleague, Dr. Layla Shaheen, who actually usually does this talk. Um, she couldn't make it to this meeting. And so I'm kind of a sub for Layla, uh, but I'm I'm very happy to be here. So most of you know this slide, so I don't really need to go into it, but I will, it's kind of repetitious, isn't it? You hear the same themes over, but I want to uh, draw your attention to the fourth bullet, right? Lactating individuals have historically been left out of drug development trials, and most drugs that are approved don't have lactation information. It's usually non-clinical toxicology that what we call the PPND study, the pre and postnatal development study where they get dosed uh, through birth and then during lactation. So you can't really separate was the effect of the drug from being exposed, the animal exposed in utero or through milk. So they're of limited value. Sometimes there are lactation studies done in animals and we put that information into labeling. And what I've heard over and over again is, of course, the animals don't necessarily translate to human and we don't know what the animal data mean. So clearly uh, improvements in data. This is something that is, you know, we talked about catchphrases and calling cards. I think um, the American Academy of Pediatrics, ACOG, all interested in supporting uh, 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 nursing lactating individuals and their um, breastfed infants. So this is another slide, you know, you saw the pre-market NDLBL review or the drug approval and then post-marketing. And again, in most situations, we don't get lactation studies pre-approval. We can require lactation studies as a condition of approval, what so-called post-marketing required study. So I'll give you a few of um, our recent efforts to advance uh, lactation data collection here at FDA or in my shop at FDA. So you might say that this is progress, and you might say this is just more evidence that we're just not doing very much. But if you look at the new drug approvals going back to 2007, so this is, you know, almost 20 years, um, you can see that um, in the blue bars, these are the number of new drugs. So these are new molecular entities approved. And then in the green bar is la our lactation PMRs that we issued at the time of the approval of the new drug. 
So you'd say, yikes, that looks horrible. Now, I would also point out that we excluded drugs that are for only male conditions or that are only for postmenopausal female conditions. So obviously lactation studies wouldn't be necessary. Um, and even in this group of, you can see um, in the blue, 50 odd approvals per year now in the last six years, there are some drugs that are less commonly used. There are drugs that are more likely to be used in older females, but still include a subset of females of reproductive potential. And those are still included in these numbers. But overall, you can see if we're hitting, you know, um, even 15 percent, um, you know, that's uh, about as good as we're getting right now. The other thing I'll point out is in 2019, uh, we published a clinical lactation studies guidance, FDA did. And we think that that may have played a little bit of a role in this slight uptick, but clearly we have a ways to go in terms of uh, FDA's ability to issue lactation studies. So here is the guidance, as I mentioned, is published in draft form in 2019. I'm gonna go over just a few things. And these are the conditions under which we state explicitly in the guidance that, that industry and sponsors should consider the conduct of lactation studies. So a drug under review, a new drug that hasn't been approved yet, but is expected to be used by women of, re, women of reproductive age. Um, after approval, if it looks like uh, lactating individuals are, it's becoming evident that they are using it when we weren't sure if they were using it, right? So uh, reports, um, you can even, we can even do uh, use, um, use reviews. We have a division within our office or in FDA who can look at uh, use of a drug. That um, the drug is already there, but it really wasn't being used in lactating individuals. And now there's a new indication that really will likely to be used. We can then require a lactation study, even though we didn't uh, when the drug was first approved. And then here is the place where I think we've heard a lot about where BPCA has already done uh, a lot of work with the Cuddle study, marketed medications that are commonly used by uh, females of reproductive potential. Uh, so a whole host of medicines that have been approved, maybe there's no patent life left, and we really just need to collect that lactation uh, information. We also talk about who can be enrolled in a lactation study. And, you know, I think that this is important because we do set up the idea that you don't have to have uh, a patient who's actually taking the drug clinically in order to enroll them in a lactation study. Obviously, uh, 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 females uh, who are um, uh, above uh, the legal age can consent they're not vulnerable. They can consent themselves to con to participate in a lactation study. So healthy female volunteers can participate in a lactation study, even if they're not taking the drug. The issue there is that if they're willing to participate, that risk to the infant, that, that nursing infant is a risk that would be unacceptable because there's no benefit to the exposure of that drug. So in those situations, uh, we have to counsel females, uh, individuals that they have to pump and discard the, the, the store, uh, pump and discard the milk, and they can actually uh, plan in advance and pump and store milk so that the baby can be fed during the length of the lactation study. But that's an important consideration. Lactation studies can also be conducted pre-approval, but that drug is still considered investigational. And so that's the same, the same rules apply here for the infant. But if a lactating woman is taking, a lactating individual is taking that drug for uh, clinically prescribed purposes, she's taking it because it's needed. That baby is already exposed. So there's no need to interrupt breastfeeding in that in, in, uh, in instance. Okay. Study methods, I'm not going to go through because they're all a lot of different studies. I think one of the things we learned from this lactation workshop we conducted in 2014 is that a lot of times the milk only study is the only study you need. You just want to know, is it transferred into the milk? And if it's not, if it's not transferred in uh, clinically relevant quantities, then you're done. But what we're finding out is, is that actually we do need to know a little bit more and it would be nice to know a little bit more. So I think the idea of the mother-infant pair study is one that FDA is really thinking about when should we be actually asking for these studies right off the top. We get mother data, we get infant data, we get infant milk, and we get infant serum. So we know even if it's transferred to the breast milk that maybe there is no appreciable clinically relevant quantity actually that's absorbed by the infant. So we're thinking more about how these mother-infant pair studies can 
can help us collect more uh, interpretable and more really uh, actionable uh, data that we can include incorporate in, in product labeling. Okay, so I've already mentioned the PLLR, the, uh, the uh, Pregnancy Lactation Labeling Rule, and you can see there's a risk summary and clinical considerations. I'll just give you a quick example. This is an example of a drug that was approved and uh, there was a lactation study and we were able to incorporate information into labeling. So in the risk summary, I point out uh, very importantly in the third line or second line, minimal uh, sertilizumab pegol concentrations were observed in breast milk. No serious adverse reactions were noted in the 17 infants in the study. And then at the end, the required statement, developmental health benefits of breastfeeding should be considered. So here we think that this is an accurate statement. Um, it maybe doesn't go as far as you can say, well, please go ahead and breastfeed. But that 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 term, that that FDA term for please go ahead and breastfeed is that developmental health benefits. That's that last um, sentence there. This is just the data. So we put a lot of data in there, but I think the important thing is the risk summary that uh, I just showed you. Okay, so what is FDA doing in terms of labeling research and lactation? So what we wanted to do, and you know, again, we've heard it a lot, we don't understand what the labeling statements you're making. So we, we got money um, through um, FDA to help us understand what practitioners actually understand about lactation labeling. So we did this focus group testing and we, we utilized uh, social scientists to help us structure questions and interviews with prescribers to help us understand how where we were doing well in language and labeling where we needed help. And so the key findings of this research were that, yeah, the PLLR generally gives useful information and, the, and it would be helpful to have a more concise summary that, that prescribers can use at point of care, including potentially the use of infographics. Narratives are too long. And um, I think that what also came to us through this research was that uh, healthcare providers did understand that there oftentimes are limited data. And unfortunately, um, that limited human data really doesn't help translate to when they're sitting in front of the patient and that the animal data really are just not that useful in a, in a clinical interaction. All right, so my last few slides are on collaborations. Obviously, this is a major collaboration for FDA. Um, and you've already heard, I think, a lot about Preglac, and so I'm not going to talk about Preglac. I think Sue and others, uh, Sarah, have really discussed that very nicely. Um, you've heard about the recommendations and that they're all relevant to lactation collection. This is an important area, and I know that we're going to have some, uh, I know Rachel's already here to talk about the Cuddle study. The only thing I want to say about Cuddle is, and this is how collaborations, and this is how the next best idea happens. So I was sitting in a room like this, I think it was 2016 or 2017, and we were over at FDA at White Oak, and Kevin Watt and I were having lunch together. And I was talking to Kevin, and I said, you know, Kevin, you know how we use BPCA to do these off-patent drugs? I was just thinking, what do you think if we were to do the same thing, but on the lactation side? And his eyes got giant. And he said, that's not a bad idea, Lynn. Let me think on it. That was 2015, 2016, and we have cuddled because of that little interaction. So my other plug for you today is make use of the time you have together and have those over lunch conversations because they can lead to, I think, important changes. You know, I it, it wasn't, I mean, maybe I had the idea, but it was really Kevin who took the idea and ran with it and created uh, this uh, new this study within the PTN that I think is really helping to incorporate lactation information in product labeling in drugs that are often used uh, during lactation. So in summary, I don't need to tell you that this is an important health issue. I do need to remind you that um, I hear you. I think all of us at FDA hear you, and we are absolutely committed to working with you to see what we can do about improving where you believe the roadblocks are, are where you believe the challenges are, so that we can work together to get this information out to prescribers and the individuals who really need this information. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any brief questions, comments? I'll ask one. Do you think the, that there will be an upward trajectory in the number of lactation studies that will be required? Yeah, you know, we did that study early. Um, you know, 
So we are expecting and hoping. I will say without saying anything, so this is a statement of nothing, but there are external challenges that we face. Um, forget about the internal challenges. You know, when you heard uh, such and thus division said, can't do it, you know, um, uh, impossible, or you got to do it slow, or, you know, you got to do it, you know, we, w we won't approve this. One of the, just one little tidbit. If you get that answer, we would welcome you to contact the Division of Pediatrics and Maternal Health um, and ask politely whether or not we've been involved in the discussions. Now, that doesn't mean that we can fix things, and sometimes we get stuck, but we can enter the conversation and at least help to help the divisions understand uh, where, uh, where the uh, challenge is, and we hope that we can help. So that's one tidbit. Um, the, the second thing is that there are external uh, challenges all the time. And, you know, we're in an environment now that we never thought we would be in, um, in terms of, you know, judges overturning scientific decisions that FDA has made. So I just want you to understand that we are trying, but there are certain forces that are, you know, pushing to actually limit FDA's authority in many areas. Um, and so uh, any help that we can get in terms of public outcry would be useful. Thank you. Thanks very much. All right, more on the panel. Oh, sorry, one more. Very sorry, quick sorry, question. Um, I noticed um, the timing for milk collection that you had commented on mature milk after 10 days postpartum. Can you just comment on how we can extrapolate or interpret data on colostrum? Um, because that's really the decision and time point that if people don't choose to express and establish breastfeeding within you know three to five days, they're really unlikely to even be doing so um, beyond that time point. And so that's really the critical time frame for commenting on um, exposure and safety to establish breastfeeding? Yeah, no, that's a terrific question. So really the idea is, look, if you're going to wait 10 days before you enroll, they're either decide they are or they aren't. The time now is right after birth and right as they're beginning, can I get them enrolled and can I start enrolling them? So, so the answer is that I'm not uh, the milk scientist, but I know enough that colostrum is so different from mature milk that it would be hard, I think, to extrapolate. Nevertheless, I think there are ways that we can consider enrollment to say, okay, we're going to enroll you as soon as you deliver. And we want you to give the baby the colostrum and we're going to bring you into or collect those samples once you're at 10 days. There's another group that we, it's not like we don't want the colostrum, right? So if a woman says, no, I, I'm not interested, but I'll do it now then we could collect that colostrum too. So I think there's two ways to do it. And I think there's different strategies in terms of how we approach um, uh, uh, individuals after they've delivered to get that information. All right, thank you. 